Hello viewers. Today we're getting straight into the action with five modern takes on the classic side-scrolling platform shooter formula. And we begin with this. Death Wish Enforces harks back to a time when the world didn't worry about political correctness. It was a time when sexual harassment was just a hobby and climate change simply meant adjusting the dial on the air conditioning. The biggest problem facing the police in this era was rescuing women with big wobbly boobies. Released in April 2023, Death Wish and Forces is currently only available for the Playstations and the Switch and plays like a cross between the Konami classic Sunset Riders and Namco's Rolling Thunder series. You'll need to choose from one of four player characters, each a replica of a late 60s early 70s action hero trope, armed with different guns and featuring slightly different stats for speed and power. But don't expect to see huge differences in the gameplay no matter who you plump for. Indeed the speed of movement could have been better with each character shuffling along like they've had to quickly jump off the toilet with their pants still around their ankles. As much as anything, this is probably a deliberate ploy to stretch out the playing time on the comparatively short levels, and you do get used to it. It is annoying, however, to find an inflexible control scheme, particularly one that uses circle slash B for jump and cross slash A to shoot, depending on your system of choice. Everybody knows it's cross slash A to jump. Everybody. Why change this? The game could also use a button to hold you in place while you shoot, something that'd be particularly useful for bosses when you want to hit weak spots from a safe distance. But once you've taken a minute to adjust, the game plays a good giggle, especially with two, three or even four players all on screen at once. This is old school arcade in its rawest form, with one shot kills, pattern recognition and traps to consider every few seconds, in addition to some surprisingly deadly bird crap. The graphics, sound and music are all perfect for the setting with plenty of impact and the collision detection is spot on. There's some good variety in the levels, including these motorcycle sections and each character is different enough to warrant multiple playthroughs. The puerile humour and the aforementioned fiercely breasted damsels won't strike a chord with every modern gamer, but it's all very tongue in cheek and shouldn't be taken seriously. At 18 pounds or 23 bucks for my American friends, Death Wishing Forces is a bit pricey for this type of game, so watch out for its inevitable discount on the digital storefronts. Blazing Chrome. Blazing Chrome is very contra. Very contra. And by that I mean it's contra. The look, the feel, and the fact that the game is, as we say in polite society, busted hard, it really does take you back to those intense sessions with the Super Nintendo games of the 90s. But imitation wouldn't mean anything if the game didn't get the mechanics right, and fortunately developer Joy Masher have definitely nailed it. The controls are fluid and responsive, the speed is pitched perfectly, and the shooting with any of the weapons that you collect throughout the levels feels impactful. But your mileage with this game will depend on how you feel about the difficulty. Even on the easiest setting, Blazing Chrome will challenge you with numerous quick enemies and bosses that just love being tickled by your bullets. That's probably why you pick up this game though, so that's hardly a criticism. And playing with two characters is as helpful, hectic and satisfying as anything during the 16-bit era. There are only six levels, but they're mostly quite lengthy for a game of this type and you can tackle the first four in any order you'd like. Checkpoints also ease the pain of failure as you eat through your continues, allowing you to resume a run even if you've come away from the game entirely for a while. Blazing Chrome could have done more to establish its own identity. Weapons and level layout are a bit too familiar at times, but overall it's a tight, cheap package that scratches that Mode 7 nostalgia itch, alone or with a friend, and it's a great test for trophy or achievement hunters. Valfaris couldn't be more metal if you played as a cast iron Ozzy Osbourne battering people to death with a Gibson Explorer to the strains of Master of Puppets. In fact, the game's actually not far off that image, with a hint of Norse fever dream thrown in for good measure. Valfaris is one of the most complete games in this list, with substantial level design, an evolving story and weapon progression more akin to a Metroidvania, although there's no backtracking you're always driving forwards. And the story doesn't get in the way with endless cutscenes or reams of text either. 
you'll have a quick conversation here and there to discuss objectives, which is often quite amusing, and then off you go again. The graphics are very HR Geiger, with twisted enemy design that just keeps getting weirder and more inventive. The variety of boss encounters is particularly impressive, and it's even better that every one of them is fair. You'll inevitably fall at your first attempt, and very often your second, third, or even tenth, but there's always an answer, and it's usually found by switching out your weapons and equipment to adapt to the current scenario. Even the most basic weapons have a nice heft to them, and everything hits with impact, but it feels especially good to have collected enough blood orbs in the world to max out your favourite gun and shred through the grunts or pummel a boss that had been giving you endless grief. There's a good deal of platforming on offer here, but nothing that demands absolute precision. There are also several hidden rooms, but nothing abstract. You just walk through a wall in most cases. Everything works in service of the pacey, bloody combat, and like any of the Soulsborne games, you can't wait to see what hideous monstrosity lies around the next corner. Rounding out the package is a new game plus mode that lets you tear through the game again with all your previously acquired upgrades. Release that ponytail and get moshing. Guns, Gore and Cannoli 2, and its prequel, was one of those games that I'd heard of but never expected to try. I think the title and the thumbnail art seem too much like the kind of cheap trophy or achievement shovelware that you see clogging up the digital storefronts for next to no money. You know the ones, they're usually called things like Stroke the Beaver or Bread Up Your Arse. But over time I started to notice this game on several best of lists, and when it dropped below two English pounds on the PS Store, I had to give it a go. I'm so glad that I did. Guns Gore and Cannoli 2 is an expert blend of control, art and playability that makes it very difficult to put it down once you start playing. Primarily set in the war-torn 40s, I was immediately surprised and impressed with how the perfectly lip-sync cartoon story gets things underway. It's refreshing to actually want to watch a cutscene. Joe, it's Vinny. Listen. I got half the friggin' town tailing me. You gotta get me the hell out of here, fast! Better yet, the hand-drawn levels look fantastic and never really repeat themselves in the way that many traditional side-scrolling games often do. You'll genuinely feel a sense of progression through a town, a sub-base, or across the beaches at Normandy, to name just a few areas, and you'll always look forward to seeing the next location. There are a ton of different weapons at your disposal, which all feel great to use, and swapping between them on the fly is easy. Aiming is done with the right stick, and the game features a clever lock-on targeting system that you can lean into or ignore, depending on your preferred control options. While mapping jump to the left trigger by default means you can keep firing in the right direction at all times, without any unnecessary thumb gymnastics. At any point, enemies can suddenly appear at all sides, but it never feels overwhelming or unfair. The same goes for the boss fights, which are also very carefully considered and offer something different every time. Nothing goes on for longer than it should, and casual gamers will be delighted to know that, for once in games like this, the normal difficulty setting strikes that rare balance between challenge and fun. I almost feel embarrassed that I managed to pick this game up so cheaply, albeit getting on for six years after its initial release. Don't make my mistake and stay away. Check this out as soon as you can. Down. And finally for this list today, Hunt Down is the game that I'd always hoped would be released, ever since I heard the words Mega Drive, about 35 years ago. Better late than never. The look and attitude of this game would have been a great fit for Sega's defining console, not that it could have run something this expansive back in the day of course. And therein lies the genius of this game, alongside other modern retro masterclasses like Sonic Mania. It's the subtle refinement that transforms nostalgia into something beautifully playable that's only possible on today's hardware. Hunt Down has got the lot. Three varied and distinctive player characters, buttloads of chunky weapon power-ups, tons of colourful enemies and bosses, great pace, tight controls, secrets and challenges, an excellent 80s synth soundtrack, it really nails that 80s feel, actually. It makes me want to drink Soda Stream while watching Robocop or the original Terminator, although I might skip the big hair and shoulder pads this time around. 
As always, the experience is better with two, and the game accommodates couch co-op really well, with most levels having several layers to scale, allowing for a surprisingly tactical approach to many of the firefights. My one and only real complaint is that the level design is quite samey from an aesthetic perspective, although from a design standpoint, as I say, you have plenty of verticality, and I appreciate the little touches like being able to back into doorways and avoid incoming fire. Hunt Down is otherwise a consistently brilliant game that offers several hours of entertainment with each new playthrough, and anyone with even a passing interest in side-scrolling shooters needs to check it out. There are so many great modern retro shooters out there now. Which ones are you playing? I'm sure I'll be back with another list of great games like these very soon, along with plenty more modern and retro action. In the meantime, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ding that thing so you never miss out. Cheers for now. Uh, that was the money shot.